Episode 131, Mr. Grint Takes a Student Bertha's call was too abrupt. It made Mr. Grint uneasy as he rushed to the hospital. The moment he saw Bessie, his heart relaxed. Upon hearing his voice, Grace returned to her senses. She turned her eyes in disbelief at Bessie and then stared at Mr. Grint and whispered, Mr. Grint! Grace had seen him during Anne's competition. It was his last performance when he commented on Anne. She also frequently heard of him in the conversations of the Perez family and others. Grandpa Perez always spoke in awe of him and didn't dare to elaborate. Grace often thought about what would happen if Mr. Grint had accepted Anne as his student. She knew Mr. Grint, but he didn't know her. Mr. Grint wasn't surprised that someone recognized him. He just nodded politely to Grace, alienated and indifferent. Bessie heard the familiar voice and turned around. She saw Mr. Grint at a glance. A middle-aged man stepped up and stood beside him. He arrived just behind him and followed him inside. Mr. Grint, why are you here? Bessie asked with surprise. She paused and pivoted away from him. She didn't know what expression to show towards him. Mr. Grint smiled and continued to move forward naturally, without his usual dignity and alienation. Even his tone was natural as he said, If the mountain doesn't come to me, I go to the mountain. He didn't mention Bertha. Didn't I say after next year's SATs? Bessie knew he was talking about accepting her as a student. Did my grandma ask you to come? Mr. Grint smiled calmly. You finally relaxed. So of course, I have to keep a tight eye on you. What if I wait for a year and you change your mind and leave? Whom would I cry to? It wasn't unusual for Mr. Grint to do such a thing. Bessie reluctantly accepted his explanation. Mr. Grint turned to the man beside him and said, Bessie, you remember Mr. Sampson? The middle-aged man beside Mr. Grint respectfully spoke. Bessie, when Mr. Grint spent the six months in Fairfield trying to persuade Bessie to be his student, the middle-aged man introduced himself to him and got to know her. He knew how much Mr. Grint sacrificed for this apprentice, so he was very respectful to her. Bessie nodded and smiled. Then she greeted him politely. Nice to see you again, Mr. Sampson. The three of them talked as they walked towards Bertha's room. They talked as if they had known each other for years. It wasn't difficult to understand from their conversation that Bessie and Mr. Grint had known each other for many years, and Mr. Grint had come for her. The most important thing was that Bessie still seemed to hesitate about it. Grace stood on the spot like a piece of wood, shocked at what unfolded. Thunder seemed to flash in her mind. Did she just see Mr. Grint in Chicago? And how was it that he knew Bessie and wanted to accept her as his student? Grace stared at the three of them as they entered Bertha's room. Mr. Grint was very prestigious in the Perez family, and here he was, being extremely accommodating to Bessie. She stood there, without even the strength to press the elevator button. Grace knew that, based on the seniority status in Evanston, even the Anderson family couldn't compare with the Grint family. The Grint family not only had their social connections, but Mr. Grint's achievements in the violin field were simply beyond those of Mr. Anderson, not to mention most of the other upper echelon families. The gap was too wide. So Grace had thought more than once about what would have happened if Mr. Grint took Anne as his student. But now, she saw that Mr. Grint had come from far away to Chicago to take Bessie as his student. To Grace and even to Evanston, this matter was enough to shake up the circle. Bertha told Grace that Bessie practiced the violin. But Grace hadn't taken it too seriously since Mr. Williams already stopped teaching her. Based on the education level, the teachers who taught Anne were much more advanced than those in Fairfield. The Smith family had always been generous regarding Anne learning the violin, and even her violin was custom-made for a fee of $5,000. No matter how much Grace thought about it, she never would have imagined that Mr. Grint would take an interest in Bessie and want to accept her as an apprentice. Grace pressed her shaking hand to her chest as she thought about how bright her future would be if Bessie agreed to it. But in the next second, Grace remembered the conversation between her and Bessie earlier. 
She sobered up instantly and felt her blood run cold. Grace stared down the corridor at Bertha's room and could almost feel the regret condensing together in her intestines. Then it felt like she swallowed her heart. If he had arrived five minutes earlier, Grace's hands stiffly pressed the button on the elevator. The Smith family's driver was waiting downstairs, and she returned home stiffly. She sat on the sofa. It was early winter, but she still poured herself a glass of ice-cold water from the refrigerator and sipped it down. Still, it couldn't cover the fire raging inside of her over the ordeal. Daryl and the others were still there. They came downstairs and were discussing finding a time to visit Bertha. This had been almost impossible in the past. Seeing Grace's strange expression, Daryl asked kindly, "'What's wrong? Is your mother in a poor condition?' David also looked at her with concern. Grace put down the glass and shook her head. She looked very startled. They already had this attitude towards her because Mr. Anderson had accepted Anne as a student. What attitude would they show if they knew that Mr. Grint wanted to accept Bessie as his student? In the hospital, Bessie moved two chairs for Mr. Grint and Mr. Sampson to sit in. She leaned on Bertha's bed. Bertha leaned on her pillow, her face glowing rosily and looking very energetic. Mr. Grint, I've troubled you to come down. Mr. Grint looked at her condition and his heart sank, but he hid it from his expression and laughed. If I can get an impressive student by running down here, I don't mind going out of my way at all. They were extremely familiar with one another, so Mr. Grint naturally knew that Bessie didn't listen to anyone other than Bertha. As long as Bertha insisted, he might be able to pull off this matter of apprenticeship early and with little trouble. In the past, Mr. Grint would have happily run two rounds around the hospital, but at the thought of Bertha's deep intention, his joy dispersed. Bessie didn't pay attention to their polite exchange of words. She just leaned on the bed, looking at her phone. Daniel still hadn't messaged her. He still hadn't sent the result. Noah Hyber also didn't respond. He had been quiet ever since she sent the full version of the composition to him. It was like this every time. After she sent a rough frame, Noah Hyber would harass her on Twitter continuously to finish writing it. But after she sent him the full song, he would be quiet for a day or two. Then have a good day. Bertha and Mr. Grint were already talking about the time, so Mr. Grint paused and frowned. Even if I don't make a big deal of finding an apprentice, I still have to ask a few people to come. Now I must go to my hotel. I have some things to attend to. Because of Bertha's current state... And given that this was Chicago and not his hometown, Mr. Grint had already planned to go through a ceremony here first. He would hold a big show when Bessie went to Evanston next year. In the hotel where Mr. Grint was staying. It was the only five-star hotel in Chicago. The Chicago Violin Association arranged his accommodations and loaned him a BMW to use during his visit. Bessie realized he was staying in the same hotel as Daniel. After sending Mr. Grint to the hotel, Mr. Sampson took Bessie back to school. Although Chicago wasn't Mr. Grint's hometown, his name was still useful. After Mr. Sampson dropped Bessie off, he met Mr. Grint at the hotel. Mr. Grint put on his glasses and turned over the calendar to choose a date. He planned the invitation. He would have to invite a few people from the Chicago Violin Association. Mr. Grint flipped through his phone book and glanced at Mr. Sampson. By the way, is Rick also in Chicago? There were several spectators at his performance, including the Soup, White, and Clark families. Among these people, he had eaten with Rick several times. They were well acquainted. Mr. Sampson thought about it and nodded. I heard they dispatched him to Chicago. Isn't that a coincidence? Mr. Grint added Rick to the list. Bertha was also planning to invite a few people. The Smith and Wilson families were too eccentric, so Bertha didn't intend to inform them. The rest of the invitation included some friends of Bessie, Pete, and the others. She included Scarlett, but Luke couldn't return on such short notice. She didn't know if Daniel was still in Chicago. Bertha asked the nurse to bring her a pen and paper. 
Even though it was late, she didn't sleep and wrote the names one by one. As she wrote, the nurse exclaimed, Miss Wilson, your handwriting is beautiful. She wrote one stroke at a time with good penmanship. Bertha smiled casually and put down the pen. Then she squinted and thought of the good-looking young man. She thought for a while and picked up her phone to call Michael. Episode 132 Banquet Guests Back when the medicine CNS was scarce, Bertha had taken Michael's phone number. Michael had also visited her several times without especially asking anything. But Bertha had guessed that he was monitoring Bessie when she injured her hand. The phone rang once, and he answered it. In a villa in Chicago, Michael faced a mannequin. When he received the call from Bertha, he tossed the scalpel he held onto the table. He walked briefly and then hung up. He looked down at his phone in deep thought and leaned to one side. Samuel was sitting on the sofa, his fingers flicking away the ashes on the table as he glanced at Michael and asked, Michael, who was it? Miss Wilson, she invited me to an apprenticeship banquet. Michael put his phone aside as he spoke. Miss Wilson? Samuel glanced at Michael with a cigarette in his hand, particularly puzzled. He thought about everyone he knew in Evanston, but couldn't think of anyone that would qualify as Miss Wilson to Michael. After all, even though Michael was young, his seniority wasn't small. Michael stood and leaned against the table, thinking with his eyes closed about what to send. He had received a message, but he was lazy and distracted and didn't want to reply. While helping Robert process some data, Marvin heard this and looked up. It's probably Bessie's grandma, right? Bertha had accompanied Michael to the hospital last time and remembered her. Oh, Samuel nodded. He remembered something that energized him. Wait, does that mean this is Bessie's apprenticeship banquet? Yeah. Michael responded as he opened his phone and reluctantly sent a message. Marvin, pick up something at the airport tomorrow morning. Marvin put down the things in his hand and nodded. Okay. Samuel stood up and scratched his head. Why didn't she invite me? How could I not be there for Bessie's apprenticeship banquet? He snuffed his cigarette and picked up his phone to call her. Robert didn't attend any banquets and wasn't interested in Bessie's apprenticeship banquet. He put down the notebook in his hand and then leaned on the sofa, sneering. What hacker alliance? They're just garbage and useless. He had asked them to check on the news of Daniel. He was in Chicago. They couldn't hide online information forever. But who knew that the Hacker Alliance would tell him directly that he wasn't in Chicago? Bessie returned to her dormitory. Mary was playing games when she walked in. She turned her head slightly when she saw Bessie. Bessie, is your aunt okay? She's fine. Bessie opened the closet door and took out a towel and clothes to take a shower. Mary felt slightly relieved after hearing this. And then she said something to the boys in the game. Mary was playing in the arena with Paul and several other boys in the class. After her shower, Bessie dragged a chair over and sat down on it, turning on the computer while wiping her hair with a towel. The cell phone on her table lit up and she glanced at it. It wasn't a message from Daniel, but a message from Mr. Grint about the apprenticeship banquet. He and Bertha chose the date of December 3rd. It was next Tuesday, and there were two or three days left. He also asked if Bessie had any friends to invite. Bessie didn't pay attention to calendars, so she readily accepted the date they chose. She looked at the last sentence that Mr. Grint sent. Bessie turned and glanced at Mary, her eyes squinting deep in thought. Bessie cared little about the apprenticeship banquet but Bertha would probably like to see her bring friends over. Mary showed her winning hand with a flush, so the other players turned on the voice chat and the game ended quickly. After playing a game, Mary put down the mouse, put her hand on the keyboard and turned to look at Bessie. Bessie, do you want to play together? Bessie wiped her hair with her legs propped up casually on the table. She shook her head and asked, Do you have free time next Tuesday? Tuesday? Mary continued playing reluctantly after hearing that Bessie didn't want to join. I am inviting you, Paul, and several others to a meal. Bessie threw the towel aside after wiping her hair. 
Mary smiled and supported her chin with her hand. Then I have time. Bessie nodded and clicked on her phone. Daniel already sent the result over saying nothing else. She looked at it and didn't understand what it meant. Noah Hyber messaged her again, but it was trivial nonsense, like usual. Bessie didn't care. If she invited Paul, then what about Gerald and the rest? She wondered if Toby was still in Chicago. Bessie leaned against the back of the chair and threw her phone on the table in irritation. In Kenneth's bedroom, several boys sat at their desks. He was the only one in class with a single room. It was big, had a proper setup, and even the table was large. The boys in class planned to play cards there because it was so spacious. Although Kenneth was a little cold, he was very generous about it and played with them sometimes. Paul looked up after receiving Mary's reply. Bessie doesn't want to play with us in the game. The two boys sighed. Wendy couldn't be more depressed. She felt extremely displeased when she remembered how she rejected Bessie the last time when she wanted to play for her. Kenneth turned away from his computer and looked down at his exercise book. Bessie wants to invite me to dinner on Tuesday. Paul looked at Kenneth and leaned back in his chair laughing. Kenny, do you want a free meal? Bessie asked for leave on Friday and Kenneth occasionally looked over towards her empty seat in thought. Invite for a meal? Kenneth shook his head with little interest and continued to do the physical exercises. He was only halfway through when his phone rang. Kenneth picked it up and glanced at the caller ID before leaving abruptly. Anne? Everyone exchanged curious glances. After getting along for over two years, they knew Anne affected anything involving Kenneth, but recently, he seemed more indifferent. Paul nodded casually. Kenny is only interested in two things. Wendy laughed. I saw news of Anne on the internet recently, and she had 300,000 fans on her Twitter. I listened to her performance, and it's not bad. Someone posted Anne's performance online. Because of this, she became somewhat popular on the internet and gained a lot of fans. Recently, the school forum talked a lot about her. Monday. At noon, Bessie went to the school doctor's office. Samuel was sitting on a chair and giving medicine to a boy with a cold when he saw Bessie enter. Michael turned over a case file, holding a pen in one hand and a cigarette in the other, occasionally writing something. Bessie pulled a chair over opposite him, sat down and leaned lazily on the table. Michael looked up and glanced at her, then stubbed out his cigarette and took two steps forward. He opened the window and waited for the smoke to dissipate before closing it again. He asked her about Andrea's condition. Bessie leaned back and said, Andrea's mental state improved so much that she wanted to go home yesterday, but Pete tried his best to prevent it. Michael knew about that and sat back to pick up the file again. He didn't read it and just leaned on the back of the chair before asking, What teacher did you decide to apprentice with? Samuel gave a dose of medicine to the boy. Hearing the question, he stretched his legs, kicked the table, and rolled his chair to the middle before pivoting it around to face them. Yes, Bessie. What did you learn from that teacher? Did you learn how to play games? He touched his chin, showing that it was possible. Bessie propped her chin with one hand and murmured, He's just an old man. Robert pushed the door open from outside. He pulled down the black scarf around his neck and said, What's the hurry? You guys can see him tomorrow. Harvey and Marvin entered immediately behind him. Why are you back now? Samuel asked. He had wanted to say that he could find a better teacher for Bessie, but he didn't dare mention it in front of Michael. Robert borrowed human resources from his uncle and would undoubtedly turn over all of Chicago to help find Daniel. He had men at every exit. I didn't dare disturb my uncle at work. Robert dragged a chair over and sat down on it, hanging his scarf on the back. I'll find him after work. He went to try on clothes and I heard his guard say that he had a banquet. Marvin laid out the dishes on the table and Samuel picked up his fork, looking up curiously. What banquet is your uncle taking so seriously? I don't know, but I'll talk to him tonight. Robert ate a little and answered indifferently. I won't go back to Evanston until I find Daniel. Bessie looked up and glanced at Robert expressionlessly. Robert didn't notice and picked up his fork before suddenly remembering something. There's a very famous person with the CIA in Chicago. 
I asked him to block all the exits. I don't think Daniel can escape from my clutches again. Mr. Grint decided on all the people to be invited. Originally, he thought Bertha would only invite a few people, but she invited eight people in the end. They're probably Bessie's classmates. Mr. Sampson flipped through the list. I'll add a few dishes youngsters like to eat. Mr. Sampson had been to Fairfield with Mr. Grint before and naturally knew Bessie's talent in this aspect. He knew how highly Mr. Grint thought of her. The people invited were just small characters, with Robert being the most popular. Although it didn't satisfy Mr. Sampson, he settled with it for the time being. It would only be a big deal in Evanston, and he had already helped Mr. Grint choose the guests to invite to the banquet. The news of Mr. Grint's accepting a student alone was enough to shake half the industry, including the people from the Violin Association that Mr. Grint invited. The guests were enough to fill two long tables. Mr. Grint booked the banquet at the Hotel Kennedy Grand. Tuesday. After school, Bessie patiently waited in her seat with her headphones in her ears for almost all of the people in the class to leave. She removed her headphones and casually set them aside. Mary was packing her books. Bessie, shall we go now? She turned and looked at Bessie. Bessie stood up by the table and walked ahead. Scarlet and Brian waited at the top of the stairs for the three of them to come down. Brian's clothes were normally casual, and he wore mostly sportswear. But today, he wore a black trench coat with a white shirt inside, looking somewhat formal. Scarlet didn't wear the school uniform. Instead, she wore a knit dress and a coat outside. She also wore furry gloves. Mary and Paul had thought it was just a casual meal. It stunned them when the taxi stopped in front of the Hotel Kennedy Grand. Was it such a big deal? Today's her apprenticeship banquet, didn't she tell you? Brian shook the gift box he had prepared and smiled elegantly. Scarlet didn't bring a gift box, but she carried a small, bulging backpack. Paul scratched his head and prepared to give Bessie a red envelope. Mary said sheepishly, I only have one formal dress in my entire possession. I would have worn it if I knew. Was dressing the way she did impolite? Mary glared begrudgingly at Bessie. Bessie ignored them and simply looked at the message Mr. Sampson had sent her. They were on the top floor of the Hotel Kennedy Grand. The top floor was like the Heaven Lounge. There were two servers at the hotel entrance who asked if they were there for Miss Miller's banquet before politely taking them to the top floor. When they arrived, they found the room was large. The chairman of the Violin Association and several other key figures were already there. Mr. Sampson was entertaining them and quickly came forward when he saw Bessie arrive. Oh, you're all Bessie's classmates, right? Come sit here. Mr. Sampson led them to a prepared table. Bessie, are there any other classmates coming? There are still a few friends left. Bessie looked down at her phone and saw Samuel's message that they arrived. They'll be here soon. Mr. Sampson nodded and smiled. Mr. Grint went to pick up your grandma and will come back quickly. Paul carefully patted Brian's shoulder. What teacher did Bessie study under? He felt like the atmosphere was strange. Downstairs, Marvin parked his car. Samuel exited the passenger seat and looked at Bessie's message on his phone in surprise. It's on the top floor. It looks like Bessie's teacher is richer than her. Michael also got out of the car and buttoned his coat without speaking. Marvin nodded. Yes, he's indeed more impressive than I imagined. The three of them walked into the hotel. The two attendants at the entrance met them and respectfully took them to the top floor. One attendant knocked three times on the door and someone opened it from the inside. Episode 133 A Look of Confusion It was Mr. Sampson who opened the door. He was a little confused to see three young men standing outside. Of the three of them, Marvin was wearing a thin jacket in the thick of winter. Mr. Sampson could tell he was a well-trained man. As for Samuel and Michael... They looked rather laid back, but the air they exuded, especially from Michael, was fairly intimidating. Are the three of you Bessie's friends? Please come in. Mr. Sampson was a little surprised to find out that Bessie's friends were like this. 
He knew Mr. Grint for the longest time and accompanied him to many events. He knew most of the people that attended. However, he didn't recognize any of the boys and decided there were way too many households in the capital. There was no way he could remember every family member. Michael was reclusive and stayed in most of the time. Although everyone heard of him, few ever saw him. His circle was the hardest to integrate into in all of Chicago. Samuel seemed rather familiar to Mr. Sampson, yet Mr. Sampson had no recollection of a Samuel or a person known as Mr. Bright. He knew Bertha inside out, but he vaguely knew of her children and grandchildren. He never would have expected any of them to have friends there, much less those from the Bright family. Thank you. Michael straightened up slightly when he thought that Mr. Sampson might just be Bessie's teacher. The three of them followed Mr. Sampson in and soon saw Bessie and a few others sitting on the couch. Bessie, Samuel said as he quickened his steps towards her. When he saw Scarlet around too, he smiled. Your classmate is here too? It was a sizable space, more than a thousand square feet. There were two tables, a microphone, a screen and further in were a lounge and a pool table. There were three long couches in the lounge, with a coffee table in between them. Paul and Brian were on the left couch while Bessie, Scarlett, and Mary sat on the middle couch. No one occupied the one on the right. Marvin sat beside Paul. Michael casually sat on the other side. Paul was talking to Brian, but stopped when he saw Samuel and Michael. Paul remembered how his mother mentioned something about Michael, it wasn't much, but he remembered it clearly. Mary, Marvin, and Michael were familiar with most of them around here, not to mention Scarlet and Paul. Hence, nobody felt too awkward, even if they weren't all from the same circles. On the other side, a few middle-aged men whispered to Mr. Sampson before walking towards Bessie. After Mr. Sampson's introduction, they knew Bessie was the student that Mr. Grint wanted to take in. Mr. Grint was the chairman of the National Violin Association. He was internationally renowned and only rarely traveled to Chicago. His fame, popularity, and his importance in the industry made a significant difference to his students. In all aspects, his students received a head start over others. If it wasn't for Mr. Grint's students being in Chicago, they knew they wouldn't have had this opportunity. Hence, they all greeted Bessie before Mr. Grint arrived. One man said, Hello, Bessie. I'm George Alston. Mr. Grint taught me a few lessons before. Bessie reclined on the couch in a rather laid-back manner, but as they arrived, she got up and greeted them politely. It took about five to six minutes for the group of them to finish speaking and take their leave. They're all students of your teacher? Samuel watched in shock as the group of middle-aged men wearing suits walked away. They're pretty nice to you. Bessie sat back down and returned to her usual self. Mmm. Samuel didn't expect Bessie's teacher to be so capable. Your teacher isn't here yet. What does he teach you? It wasn't just Samuel who was curious. Paul, Mary, Marvin, and the rest were rather interested too. They looked away from the people who had just left and turned to Bessie instead. Michael reached for a lighter in his pocket and fiddled with it, but he didn't take a cigarette out. He looked over at Bessie as well. Bessie was sitting on one side of the couch with her arm on the armrest, sipping some tea. She cleared her throat upon hearing the question and said, The violin. Paul and Mary heard about Bessie knowing how to play the violin, so the news didn't surprise them much. But Marvin, Samuel, and the rest knew nothing about it. Michael raised a brow. You can play the violin? Hmm. Bessie squinted her eyes. Samuel straightened up and looked at Bessie with many surprises. Why haven't you mentioned this before? Marvin still had a cup of water in his hands. He couldn't drink alcohol because he was driving. Her confession even surprised him. Most violinists would be rather calm and resilient. But Bessie was nothing like that. She would get frustrated after ten minutes of penmanship practice. She would even throw her pen aside sometimes. Bessie turned to look at Samuel and then put her cup on the coffee table. Why do I have to tell you I can play the violin? Samuel was speechless. Someone knocked on the door again. Mr. Sampson was standing near the door, waiting. 
Mr. Grint messaged he was arriving soon. He instantly opened the door. Instead of Mr. Grint, he found two middle-aged men standing before him instead. One was a rather smiley man, dressed in prim and proper clothes, making him appear formal. The other dressed in casual clothes, but seemed colder and less approachable. Mr. Sampson had a list of names for the people Mr. Grint invited, but he couldn't find any of them on it. Do you have invitations? Mr. Sampson asked politely. Instead of answering, one man asked a question of his own. May I ask if Miss Bessie is inside? Officer Gomez was one man. When he saw Bessie sitting inside, he pointed her out and said, We know Bessie. Mr. Sampson didn't want to make a scene, so he invited them in. Well then, you must be Bessie's guests. Please come in. The couch that Bessie was on was full, so Mr. Sampson instructed a couple of attendants to bring extra chairs over and prepare some juice for the men. Several of the guests from the National Violin Association got up and walked towards Bessie. Mr. Sampson passed them and asked curiously, Chairman Alston, haven't you already said hi to Bessie? Mr. Alston replied sternly, The mayor is here. It would be rude if we didn't greet him. Mayor Grant was a righteous man and rarely attended unscheduled events. Mr. Sampson was stunned. Who are you referring to? I'm talking about the mayor of Chicago, Gerald Grant. He was the one who just came in wearing the gray suit. Mr. Alston whispered. The group went over to Bessie's side and greeted Mayor Grant. Although Gerald Grant was the mayor of bustling Chicago, he wasn't an ordinary person by any means. Mr. Grint was full of praise for the man. Mr. Sampson was curious how the mayor of Chicago knew Bessie and why he was there to attend her banquet. And he came. Bertha was preparing to be discharged. Mr. Grint spoke to Bertha's doctor and the doctor was agreeable to his suggestion. But Mr. Grint found that the doctor's expression was rather dark. He wasn't very knowledgeable about this field, but with the doctor explaining Bertha's condition to him, he understood that Bertha's body was at its limit. He confirmed his suspicions. Thank you so much, he told to the doctor. When he arrived at Bertha's room, he paused for a while before knocking on the door. Once he did, Pete opened it. The nurse was helping Bertha change her clothes into the bathroom. When she came out, Mr. Grint noticed Bertha seemed to be in a better state than yesterday. There was more color in her cheeks. Grandma, Grace just called. She said that she and Grandpa Smith are going to visit you today, but I told her you've got something to do. Pete handed the cell phone to Bertha so that she could return the call. Bertha looked at the phone but did not receive it. Keep it for me. If she calls again, tell her I'm out today and don't have the time. Pete did not know what had happened between Bertha and Grace, but he listened to her anyway. He didn't probe further as he placed her cell phone in his pocket. Susan isn't back yet? Bertha asked. Pete nodded without saying much. Bertha was in a good mood and didn't want to get mad at Grace or Susan. She turned to Pete. Is your mother still busy? Pete's gaze hung low as he said, Mm-hmm. Bertha smiled as she nodded. Mr. Grint informed Bertha that he got someone to drive them today. Bertha and Pete were sitting in the back seat while he sat in the front passenger seat. The roads were rather congested and it took them almost 40 minutes to arrive at their destination. As Mr. Grint opened the door and got out, his cell phone rang immediately. It was Rick. He watched as Pete helped Bertha out of the car. We're just on time. Rick has also arrived. Rick was one of the principal guests he invited to the event. The Soup family had a rather huge holding in Chicago. Mr. Grint was already paving the way for Bessie before she even began training. Upstairs, Rick arrived just before Mr. Grint. He was almost 40, but he looked about 30. He was quite sharp, and most people in Chicago could not outsmart him. In the past, Mr. Sampson avoided Rick's gaze when they bumped into each other. Seeing Rick now, he suddenly felt that he wasn't much different from the rest of Bessie's younger friends. Rick, please come in, Mr. Sampson said as he escorted Rick inside. Mr. Sampson had considered the arrangement of the room. It wasn't too appropriate to have Rick sit with a group of youngsters. Neither did it seem right to place him with those of the National Violin Association. 
He had planned to have Rick sit at the main table to wait for Mr. Grint's arrival, but seeing that Mayor Grant was already sitting around Bessie's group of friends, he hesitated. Before he deliberated long, he noticed Rick walking towards Bessie. Mr. Sampson knew that Mr. Grint invited Rick to pave the way for Bessie. He got the attendant to bring another chair over and followed Rick. Rick saw Officer Gomez and Mayor Grant. He paused and was about to walk towards them when he saw the group of youngsters on the couch. He was speechless. His gaze shifted from Michael's face to Bessie's, then gave Samuel and Marvin a look of disbelief. Michael, what are you guys doing here? Neither of them had any interest in playing the violin. Why would Mr. Grint invite them? It didn't surprise him that Mr. Grint invited Samuel, but Michael wasn't the type of person to be invited to such an elaborate event. Marvin put down his cup and looked at Rick. Rick, we'd also like to know what you are doing here. Wasn't this Bessie's apprenticeship banquet? The two of them faced each other with a look of confusion. Episode 134 Where's Daniel? Mr. Sampson signaled for the attendant to bring a chair over. He was about to introduce Bessie to Rick when he heard his exchange with Marvin. Mr. Sampson didn't have to think much to figure out Michael's identity. He watched Michael for a while, then glanced at Samuel sitting beside him. He was slightly confused. Mr. Sampson remembered that the three of them had greeted him politely when they entered. Samuel and Michael exchanged glances. Michael looked at Bessie for a bit. She was calmer than everyone else as she remained seated on the couch, apparently chatting with someone on her cell phone. Brian sat by quietly the whole time, and he only got up to greet the guests when they came. Paul and Mary remained seated the whole time, a little lost in what was transpiring around them. It wasn't so bad for Mary. She didn't know Michael or Samuel, and she had only ever seen Mayor Grant's face in the papers. As an ordinary citizen, she took little notice of these things. But Paul was different. He knew Michael and Samuel because of Kenneth, and he also knew Mayor Grant personally. He had thought that he was just here for a simple meal. But why did Bessie invite these people? Rick, please sit. Samuel finally snapped back to his senses and gestured towards the chair that the attendant brought. He then asked a question he was dying to know the answer to. Who were you invited by? Upon hearing Samuel's question, Marvin kept his eyes on Rick. Marvin and the rest thought that Bessie's apprenticeship banquet was just a simple gathering. After all, Samuel had mentioned many times that Bessie and her friends weren't well-to-do at all. Who would have expected that things were so strange around here? He could understand why Officer Gomez was there, but Mayor Grant's arrival made no sense to Marvin. It was just an apprenticeship banquet. What was the ever-busy Mayor Grant doing there? And it wasn't just him. What about Rick? Rick sat in his chair and reached for a cup of tea on the table. He looked at the group of people on the couch, cleared his throat and was about to say who invited him. That was when Pete, Bertha, and Mr. Grint arrived. Mr. Sampson immediately stepped forward to help Bertha into the hall. Mr. Grint. Rick immediately got up, approached him politely, and greeted him. He turned around and said to everyone, Mr. Grint is taking in a student today. I'm here to see who that gifted person is. With that, he noticed that Samuel and Marvin looked puzzled. Only Michael reacted to the situation and took a few steps forward. Miss Wilson. Michael looked at Bertha and greeted her. He then turned and addressed Mr. Grint. Mr. Grint first talked to Rick and then waved Bessie over to say hi to him. Rick wasn't Mr. Sampson and naturally knew who Samuel and Michael were, but it still shocked him to see Michael at such an event. He hid his surprise well, though. Mr. Grint said when Bessie arrived, Bessie, this is Rick Soup. You can call him Mr. Soup. Bessie greeted him accordingly. Rick glanced at Michael, humbled by his presence. Almost everyone had arrived, so Mr. Grint got everyone to sit down. Bertha and Mr. Grint sat in the middle. Rick sat by Mr. Grint's side, but no one dared to take the two seats beside Bertha. Everyone left the seats for Bessie and Michael. Samuel sat down and finally understood what was going on. 
He turned towards Marvin and asked, So the teacher that is supposed to take Bessie under his wing is Mr. Grint? Rick wasn't any stranger to Mr. Grint, and it wasn't hard to understand why he was around. But what surprised him was that Bessie was the student Mr. Grint wanted to teach. Marvin nodded a little stunned. He felt like he had lost a part of his brain. When Samuel asked Bessie the previous day, what had she said? Marvin was thinking about a random old man. Beside him, Mary, Paul, and a few others were discussing in hushed tones. Paul, have I heard about Mr. Grint before? His name sounds rather familiar, Mary whispered to Paul. But Marvin heard her. He poured himself a glass of cold orange juice and took a sip. This made more sense to him. Mary seemed more like the sort of person Bessie would be friends with. Sounds familiar? Paul asked. He's the teacher that Anne went to audition for and learn from. This was what Paul had heard from Kenneth. But Kenneth also said Mr. Grint didn't accept Anne, so she went to another teacher instead. Kenneth enjoyed playing the violin, and he had mentioned Mr. Grint to Paul a few times before. Back then, Paul explained that this Mr. Grint was well-renowned. After all, Anne's violin skills were top-notch at Brightbow High School. Hence, finding out that the teacher Bessie was going to learn from was none other than Mr. Grint was a shock to Paul. He picked up his cell phone and sent a message with an entire line of exclamation marks to Kenneth, expressing his shock. Kenneth replied with a single question mark. Paul replied, You will never guess who Bessie is being apprenticed to. Kenneth did not send another message. He simply wasn't interested. Paul couldn't hold it in and turned to Brian instead. What you said the other time, was it true? You said you heard someone playing the violin better than Anne. Paul didn't take it to heart when Brian used to talk about how Anne didn't play the violin well. He thought Brian was trying to sing a different tune from the rest to get Anne's attention. But Brian did not make any move to pursue her after that. Now, Paul finally believed that Brian had been speaking the truth. Brian simply looked at Paul like he was a fool. The ceremony wasn't really about the banquet. The main point was for Mr. Grint to pave the way for Bessie instead. Few of them were eating at the table. Miss Wilson, I'm Mayor Grant. Mayor Grant and Officer Gomez introduced themselves to Bertha and greeted her with respect. Bertha smiled at them. I know the two of you. Of course you're the mayor, Mr. Grant. And you, Mr. Gomez, are the police officer Bessie told me about. Officer Gomez nodded. Yes. Meanwhile, Samuel and Marvin, who knew their actual identities and backgrounds, were speechless when they heard they knew Bessie. Officer Gomez was a detective involved in investigations, but he could be considered a police officer as well. Rick coughed and almost choked on his food when he heard the introduction. Rick was involved in the incident regarding Stephen. Back then, he already knew of Bessie's existence, but he wasn't so interested in her. And now, looking at the group of people at the table, he couldn't help but realize that Michael, Samuel, Mayor Grant, and Officer Gomez were extraordinary people, whom most would never invite to an ordinary event. Mayor Grant had a promotion in sight, and soon he would be more than just the mayor. He was comparable to Rick himself. Rick met Mr. Grint the previous day and knew he didn't invite these people. Rick took a sip of his whiskey and said, Mr. Grint, this apprentice of yours is no ordinary person. She was only in ninth grade. By the time she went to study with Mr. Grint, what would she be like? Their presence surprised Mr. Grint himself. He and Mr. Sampson had thought that Bessie's friends were just her classmates. But who would have expected that each one that arrived was more prominent than the previous? She was Mr. Grint's only student, and it was no wonder that Rick valued her. The gift he prepared for Bessie was a rare and valuable violin. Rick didn't know how to play the violin, but he had a hobby of collecting them. He couldn't help buying the rare ones at auctions whenever they caught his eye. I hope you'll be just like your teacher in the future. Rick smiled. He felt that Mr. Grint's student was well-esteemed. Hence, he had already gotten somebody to bring it over a few days back. He glanced at Michael and Samuel, wondering if his gift was good enough. 
Brian casually handed Bessie a gift, but talked her into unwrapping it at home. Seeing Rick's violin, Mary was hesitant about the flower in her pocket. Bertha was unusually happy today. Although the doctor hadn't allowed her to consume any alcohol, she didn't feel the least bit upset. She held the cup of tea in her hand as she looked at the people sitting around the table. I didn't expect that with Bessie's temper, she could still have so many friends. She was a kind old lady, speaking to Michael's group once in a while, then chatting with Mary, Paul, and the rest thereafter. She watched as Brian and Scarlett handed Bessie their gifts. Bertha leaned back in her seat. Bessie placed the gifts on a seat that the attendant had specially provided for the occasion. Michael sat beside her and helped her move her chair. Bertha scanned the table. Bessie, where's Daniel? He called earlier saying that he had some issues with the car and would be a little late. Why is he not here yet? Episode 135 Ordinary Gifts from Ordinary Friends Mr. Grint didn't know exactly who Bertha invited and was shocked to find out that there were still guests who hadn't arrived. Who's Daniel? He's Bessie's friend. Bertha smiled and looked towards the door. Bessie, you'd better go ask him. Bessie picked up her fork and glanced at Michael and Samuel. She whispered, Grandma, you called him too? Those within hearing range assessed that him evidently referred to Daniel. Because Michael and others were around, so she didn't mention his full name. Yep, Daniel is all alone in Chicago. Bertha smiled. Bessie propped her chin using her hand. I'll go outside and make a call. She took her cell phone and left. Michael did not move. He simply turned to her and said, Go ahead. There were two tables in the private room, so there was constant movement. Samuel saw Bessie leave, so he poured a glass of alcohol for Bertha and Mr. Grint for a toast. He also didn't leave. He sat in Bessie's seat and asked Michael, Bessie has other friends? She had more friends than expected. Michael casually replied, I don't know. It didn't bother Samuel too much by his patronizing response. What he wanted to do most was speak to Bessie and ask her how she had suddenly learned to play the violin and was getting Mr. Grint as a teacher. This friend of hers who hasn't arrived has the last name Brown. That's the same last name as Robert's arch enemy, Samuel suddenly said. Of course, he was just remarking. He wasn't drawing a connection between the two of them. Daniel's movements were odd and unusual. Based on Robert's description, he had a lot of dealings with the CIA and the Diamond Mafia. He usually hung out in war zones, which was why Samuel found it unbelievable that he had previously seen Daniel in Chicago. Mr. Grint called Mr. Sampson over when he realized Bessie still had a friend who hadn't arrived. Mr. Grint smiled and tapped on the table. Go to the entrance of the hotel and wait there. Bessie still has a friend coming, by the last name Brown. Mr. Sampson was just as shocked to find that information out, and he left as instructed. Daniel's a young, good-looking young man, Bertha said, trying to describe him. Mr. Sampson hurried to carry out Mr. Grint's request. He dared not slow down or slack off, knowing it was Bessie's friend. He had thought that Bessie's friends would just be ordinary students. It turned out that she had some very unusual friends. Mayor Grant's arrival threw him off, and Michael's and Samuel's appearance shocked him even further. While waiting for the elevator, Mr. Sampson thought long and hard about the last name Brown in Chicago. When he was sure that Brown wasn't a rich or powerful household name, he finally heaved a sigh of relief. There weren't many people in the hallway. Bessie video called Daniel, but it didn't go through. Any normal forms of communication wouldn't reach him. He had switched off all his social media applications. Bessie kept her cell phone and looked for the bathroom sign and then walked towards it. She dismantled her cell phone while walking. There was nobody outside the bathroom on the top floor. By the time she got there, she had dismantled her cell phone completely and turned it into a microcomputer. She held the computer with one hand and tapped away on the keyboard with the other, 
She walked into the last cubicle and saw Daniel's face on the screen immediately. He had on a baseball cap and a mask. He wore a black and white checkered top. That dog flashed my face on the screen at the square. How did he get a photo of me? Although the photo was from a few years back, it had rather significant effects on Daniel's movements. Bessie never investigated him or asked around about his business. They both understood it well enough. What crime did you commit exactly? Bessie put the seat cover down and sat on it. He's been looking into it for years. I've done way too many terrible things. Back then in the Middle East, that batch of... Daniel suddenly paused. You're just a kid. Why do you care? He and Bessie knew each other online. Bessie had accepted his request. Back then, he hadn't believed that Bessie was underage. He trusted her when Wendy went to Fairfield. Fine. Up to you, Bessie said casually. I'm here. The Hotel Kennedy Grand, right? Daniel took his mask off. The man at the entrance is someone with you? He took two steps forward and waved at Mr. Sampson. You must be Mr. Brown. Mr. Sampson paused when he looked at Daniel's terrible clothing. Come with me. Before Daniel followed him, Bessie's voice came from his earphones, saying, I advise you not to come. Why not? Daniel asked. Bessie casually said a few names to remind him. There are many people here. Grandma practically invited everyone she knew from Chicago. Do you know Michael? Or is the name Samuel familiar? How about Officer Gomez? You should know who Rick is. He knew Michael and Samuel. It was Samuel who called Robert. Officer Gomez was part of the police force and was currently being harassed by Robert. Rick was Robert's uncle. Rick lent all Robert's resources to him. Bessie was afraid that Daniel might regret it if he came up. Daniel was speechless. He whispered, How do you know them? I'm sorry, I have something to attend now. I won't be coming. Daniel hung up and handed Mr. Sampson a plastic bag from his pocket. Can I trouble you to pass this to Bessie? Daniel didn't wait for Mr. Sampson to respond. He tipped his cap downwards and fled the scene as if he was being chased. He didn't even have time to contemplate how Bessie knew these people. Mr. Sampson watched Daniel scurry off with a confused expression and then looked at the plastic bag in his hand. In the top floor bathroom, Bessie disconnected her call with Daniel. She didn't leave immediately, but carefully set her computer on the coding screen. A ton of zeros and ones appeared all over the screen, moving as Bessie typed away. The photo that Robert screened wasn't hard to find. Almost three minutes later, Bessie deleted the photo streamed on the building at the square. She even deleted Robert's original files. She then tucked away her cell phone and walked out. At the same time, Robert was sitting on the couch, resting his legs on the table and making a call. Officer Gomez isn't back yet. When will he be? The other party said something in response, and Robert said nothing about the time of his return. He disconnected the call. How unlucky. Everyone's having a socializing meeting. Robert stood behind the technical personnel Rick lent him, who sat in front of a computer. Daniel's image was on the screen. The tech was trying to screen and publicize it using various channels. Suddenly, the screen went completely blue. Then it came back on again a few seconds later. Everything was normal, but Daniel's photo was gone. The computer screen darkened slowly. Just as the personnel thought it was going to become a blank, dark screen, a word suddenly flashed right in the middle in bold white font. Arrogance. Robert was stunned. What's wrong? He clenched his teeth in a seething rage. Besides Daniel, he had to nab this person backing him up too. The tech did not know what happened. I don't know, Robert. Do you have any other photographs of Daniel? When Bessie got back to the private room, Mr. Sampson had returned. Mr. Brown had something to attend to, so he left. He explained to Mr. Grint and Bertha. Bertha looked towards the door a little sadly. This child is always rushing about. Grandma, have something to eat. Bessie sat down and began scooping food into a bowl. Mr. Sampson remembered the bag Daniel gave him and handed it to Bessie. Bessie, Mr. Brown asked me to pass this to you before he left. He handed the plastic bag to Bessie. The words, Giant Supermarket, were printed clearly on the outside of the bag. 
It was a rather big plastic bag, but the item inside was only the size of an egg. Everyone at the table turned their attention to Bessie. Upon seeing the plastic bag, they heaved a sigh of relief. This was more like a friend Bessie would have. Mary took out the bottle with a flower in her pocket. Bessie, this is for you. It was a small glass bottle. There was a jade-colored flower inside. The difference between this one and the previous one was that this one had a little red tint at the edges. Bessie held the bottle up and looked at it. She then turned to Mary and said, Thank you. All of them saw what Mary had done, but they weren't too interested in these girly gifts. Only Bertha smiled and talked about how beautiful the flower was. Why would Bessie's friend give her an imitation good at such a setting? Marvin mumbled to Samuel. Samuel was staring at Scarlet, who was sitting quietly. He then leaned back and smiled. Girls are like this. Only Michael narrowed his eyes at the bottle Bessie was holding. He swept a glance past Mary as he tapped his fingers on the table while brooding over something. There were a lot of procedures for the apprenticeship banquet. Mr. Grint planned to hold another event when they returned, but he felt the one in Chicago was necessary. Mr. Sampson took a headcount of the people and found everyone was accounted for except Mr. Brown. He closed the door to the room. He stood beside Mr. Grint, watching all that was happening around the two tables, but being careful not to let his gaze cause anyone discomfort. The meal in the private room recently started, and everyone was still getting on with it. By the time it was all over, it was past eight at night. Bertha looked fatigued. Not wanting to affect the atmosphere, she got Mr. Grint's chauffeur to take her back to the hospital. As there were still ninth grade students around, Mr. Grint was ready to end the event by a little past nine o'clock. He got the chauffeur to take the youngsters back to the school. Bessie, Michael, and Paul, and the other young people went ahead. Mr. Grint and Rick stayed behind. When they had left, Mr. Grint sat back in his chair. Rick finally took out a cigarette and glanced at Mayor Grant with a smile. I didn't expect Mayor Grant and Officer Gomez to be so close to Bessie. Officer Gomez simply nodded coldly, saying nothing. Mayor Grant responded with courtesy. We worked on a case before, back in Fairfield. Mayor Grant is about to be offered a promotion. Rick looked at Mayor Grant deeply. It wasn't unusual for a mayor to be offered a promotion during a term, but it was indeed uncommon to be promoted as quickly as Mayor Grant. Mayor Grant simply replied, I'm not too sure about what happens up there. Rick smiled and turned to Officer Gomez. I have a nephew and he needs your help with something. There were three cars downstairs. Paul's family car was there for him. Bessie and Scarlett waited for Mr. Grint's car, so Michael and Samuel hung around too. It was finally the right opportunity, so Samuel asked, Bessie, how on earth do you and Mr. Grint know each other, and why did he take you in as his student? Are you that good at the violin? Right then, a van zoomed in and stopped in front of them. A young man in a black military jacket jumped out from the back, pulled his mask down until it covered his nose and smiled. There was training with the team today, but fortunately, I could make it for the last part. Episode 136 I'm left out of it? Samuel had been going on and on in Bessie's ear, but all she responded with was, Oh. He had no idea how to feel about that. He remembered how he had told Bessie he wanted to find her a better teacher, and now he felt like a complete fool. Given his reputation, the best he could have done was to find Bessie a teacher from the National Violin Association. None of them were in Mr. Grint's league. Samuel thought for a bit and realized that even his old teacher might not be able to achieve that level. The only person who could get someone like Mr. Grint was probably Michael, who would have been able to get Robert Soup as well. Samuel didn't notice when the van stopped nearby, but he was interrupted by the young man who got out of it. His eyes widened and he couldn't believe what he saw. The young man had probably come in a hurry, as he was still in the Team OST jersey. He had taken his mask off and was smiling. How could Samuel, a loyal fan, not recognize Toby? There was a match against Germany in two days, and Devil City was the venue. 
Team OST seemed to want to move its headquarters from the capital to Chicago. They hadn't gone back to the capital at all this season. Paul's car had arrived and he had already opened the door to get in, but upon seeing Toby, he closed the door. He and Samuel were different. He had bumped into Bessie and Toby before and had heard quite a bit from Kenneth about Bessie's past, so he was a lot calmer. Sun God, he said. He even waved at Toby. Toby remembered Paul too and smiled kindly. Didn't I tell you you didn't have to come? Bessie said. She had been looking down at her shoes, but upon hearing him arrive, she looked up and smiled. Bessie hadn't planned to invite a lot of people to the ceremony. Even Michael had been invited by Bertha, and he brought Samuel and Marvin along. Since so many people were already coming, she thought she might as well let Toby know about it too. She had told him it was just a casual meal. Since Toby had training that day, he had told Bessie that he would be there a little later than everyone else. He only knew that it was Bessie's apprenticeship banquet when he saw Paul's post about it. That was why he rushed all the way there, and he made it, just in time. He handed Bessie a black bag. Bessie took it and said casually, It's not ten yet, go back and finish your training. Toby looked at the group of people and asked, When will you come to watch our match? I'll save the tickets for you, for the three rounds with Germany. I'll see how it goes, Bessie shrugged. It's at Devil City, I might not have the time. Toby left in a hurry. Bessie watched as the van left, and then placed the bag Toby had handed her into Michael's car. The gifts from everyone weren't suitable to be brought back to the dormitory. She returned to the group after putting the gifts in Michael's car, and suddenly realized that Samuel's talking had ceased. It was rather quiet all around. She turned to face Samuel and saw that his brow was raised. Samuel and Marvin exchanged glances and then finally turned to look at Bessie. Bessie, was that... Sun God? Samuel asked. Yep. Bessie nodded and slipped her hands into her pockets. You're very close to him? Samuel looked at Bessie blankly. Bessie stroked her chin. I guess. Samuel took a deep breath. He wanted to grab Bessie by the collar when he asked, How did you get so close to him? Samuel had turned up for Mr. Grint's event as a form of respect, but Toby was his idol. His demeanor had changed since seeing Toby. The car Mr. Grint had arranged for them arrived. Bessie opened the car door and let Scarlet and Mary get in first. She then glanced at Samuel and smiled. We met while gaming. He's busy training today, so I'll introduce you to him next time. She got in the car, said goodbye to the rest of them, and told the chauffeur to drive off. Samuel only snapped back to reality when the car had left. Gaming? She's not even as quick as me in the game, and she managed to meet the sun god in the game? Samuel scratched his head in agitation. His jealousy was clear as he said, Doesn't that mean she's seen sun god's secret technique before? One of the best matches Toby had ever played was the one that first made him famous. That game was where the myth of Toby never losing got started. Paul was about to get back into his car. Upon hearing Samuel's words, he paused for a bit and turned to look at him sympathetically. This brat, if he knew that Bessie's skills were the best in Team OST and that she was the one member who had never shown herself, he would surely go mad. And if he only knew, he would feel like a fool. The rest of them had left and only Marvin and Samuel remained, thinking about life. Michael was sitting in the back seat of the car, waiting for them. When he saw that Bessie's car had left, he took out a cigarette and narrowed his eyes slightly. A while later, he tapped on the car window, signaling to Marvin and Samuel that he was ready to leave. Marvin took the driver's seat. The night had been such a flurry of activity, he felt a little lost, even with his hands on the wheel. He turned the key and looked up, catching sight of the pile of gifts Bessie had left in the back seat. Bessie seemed to have left all her gifts behind. Marvin finally got his voice back when he saw the glass bottle hanging on the violin. Ah, uh, Bessie's deskmate seemed to have brought a different fake flower this time. The previous flower had been the same color throughout, but this time, the edges of the petals were a different color. Marvin thought this was probably due to subpar nurturing. Samuel was on his cell phone, bombarding Bessie with messages. When he heard Marvin's voice, 
He turned to the back and recalled the flower that Marvin had mentioned to him before. But he wasn't concerned about such things and quickly returned his gaze to his cell phone. Bessie didn't answer a single question he asked. She simply sent him Toby's Twitter handle. On the other hand, Paul had just gotten home. Mom, guess who I met at Bessie's apprenticeship banquet? His mother was sitting on the couch, playing a game on her cell phone. She didn't even turn her head when she heard him ask. She just said, Change your shoes. Paul went back to the door and did as she asked. Mr. Grint. Paul went over to his mom and lowered his voice. And the two people from the school doctor's office that Kenny mentioned to me. Oh, and a person by the last name of Soup. I heard someone call him Rick, and there was also Mayor Grant. Her hands stopped moving for a moment when she heard Mr. Grint's name. It was a surprise, but it wasn't that incredible. But the names that came after were utterly shocking. Her fingers slipped, and she was killed in the game. Rick Soup? His mother couldn't be bothered with the game anymore. She tossed her cell phone aside. That's the Soup family, and the others must be from the Clark family and the Bright family. Paul scratched his head. Clark and Bright families? Mom, why haven't I heard of them? His mother side-eyed him. Of course you haven't heard of them. Now, go and take a shower. Paul dragged his feet going upstairs while his mother watched him and said to herself, He just gets to know these people by doing nothing at all. She thought for a bit and picked up her phone to make a call. Mr. White? Principal White had taught Paul's mother before, back when she was studying for her doctorate. He also helped her out once after that. When Principal White first moved to Chicago, she had recognized him and Kenneth right away. She told Paul about them, and that's why Paul's attitude towards Kenneth was different from his usual attitude towards the rest of his students. Even when the incident between Bessie and Anne took place, Paul had chosen to compromise. Paul's mother greeted Principal White politely over the phone and told him about what took place that night. Did something happen in Chicago? She asked. She subconsciously tightened her grip on her cell phone. Every single person that Paul mentioned was like a time bomb in Chicago. Principal White was still in the Capitol, with his sharp eyes hidden behind a pair of glasses. He had been drinking a cup of tea while receiving updates from a few people when Paul's mother called. He got everybody to stop for a moment as he listened to her. He suddenly froze in his seat and then stood up. Wait, what did you say? People from the Clark, Soup, and Bright families were there. Will they? Her voice was filled with worry. No. Principal White closed the file on his desk and said seriously, What did you say before that? Before that? Paul's mother thought for a while. You mean what I said about Mr. Grint taking in? He's taking in Bessie as a disciple? Principal White asked. Yes? Paul's mother said. Principal White hung up and stood by the window, deep in thought. One of his assistants cautiously asked, Mr. White? Principal White came back to his senses and wrapped his fingers around his cell phone tightly. What time is it now? Are there still flights back to Chicago? Get me the earliest flight available. The assistant hurriedly checked for flights on his cell phone. Chicago was an ordinary city. Since it wasn't any special occasion or festival, there were only a few flights each day. It was close to 10 p.m., and there weren't any more tickets for that day. Mr. White, the earliest one will be tomorrow morning at 8. The assistant reported to him. Principal White didn't want to wait that long, but he had no other choice. All right. He looked down at his cell phone with eyes that were filled with jealousy. Mr. Grint's about to become her teacher, and I wasn't informed. The next day, the last period of classes in the afternoon, was mathematics. Mr. Scott was discussing the paper they had all done over the weekend. It was a difficult paper and had taken him three lessons to finish going through it. There was one last question left. It was an extremely complex question. Almost the entire cohort was unable to do it. Mr. Scott picked up his chalk as he got to the last bit. Bessie wasn't too attentive in class. Besides the physics teacher, no other teacher bothered her. They would rather she sleep in class or just practice her penmanship. During this lesson, she practiced her writing stroke by stroke on her paper. Just as the class was about to end, she suddenly put her pen down and leaned back in her chair. 
She then took a look at the blackboard and tapped on her desk casually. Mr. Scott got shocked when she suddenly looked up. He suddenly stopped talking and looked at what he had written on the board, wondering if he had gotten a step wrong. He then wrote the last step down and looked at the final answer a little doubtfully. Bessie didn't say anything. Mr. Scott cleared his throat and began explaining again. When the bell rang, he finally heaved a sigh of relief. He dismissed the class and then took a few more glances at the board. Bessie headed straight for the school doctor's office right away. She still hadn't gotten her gifts from where she left them in Michael's car the previous night. Mr. Scott stayed behind for a little while longer. He took the chalk and went through his calculations all over again, only being put at ease when he found that there was no error. He then tossed the chalk onto the desk and left the class with the paper. He saw Principal White when he was about to leave. Principal White? Yes. Principal White looked past him and saw that Bessie wasn't in her seat. Bessie isn't around? There were only a few students in the class who hadn't left yet. Someone said, Principal White, Bessie probably went to the school doctor's office. Principal White had even more mixed feelings upon hearing that. He nodded and thanked the student before making his way to the school doctor's office. When he got there, the door was ajar, and there weren't many people inside. Principal White knocked on the door. It was Marvin who opened the door. He had an empty teacup in his hand, all ready to make Bessie some tea since she had just arrived. Thinking it would be a student at the door, he was stunned to see the principal. Principal White? Episode 137 A Gathering with the Four Big Families Marvin had heard about Principal White from Samuel and the others, but he had never seen him at the school doctor's office before. Still, he had seen way too many big shots in Chicago recently to be very impressed after the initial shock. Who are you looking for? Perhaps he was looking for Michael or Samuel. The Bright family and the White family were on neutral terms. However, it was the Clark family who had more dealings with the White family. The door was open and Principal White could see Bessie was inside the room. Principal White turned his gaze from her back to Marvin. I'm looking for Bessie. Bessie? Marvin was a little surprised. He went back into the room and told her. Bessie, Principal White is outside. He asked for you. Bessie was holding on to the black bag that Toby had given her. Upon hearing Marvin, she put it down. Bessie then stood up and started to walk out, leaving Marvin slightly confused. He watched as she headed for the door. Kenny, he said in a hushed tone. Is Principal White very close to Bessie? Why is he looking for her? Samuel placed a bottle of medicine into the glass cabinet and turned around. Is he taking her on as a student, too? He remembered Principal White talking about finding a successor. His hands slowed down in their movements. Are you being serious? Marvin asked. He poured himself a cup of water. Mr. Grint was imparting a skill, but it was different from Principal White. He taught more than a skill. His choice of a successor could mean huge changes for the White family and even for the Capitol. So many people in the Capitol were waiting for him to choose. If he chose Bessie for the job, the Capitol would be in chaos. Samuel finished organizing the medicine and then placed the stock list on the table. He glanced at Michael and began thinking about the possibility of it happening. In the courtyard, Bessie couldn't help but give a light cough. Principal White had been staring at her for far too long. The wind was very strong outside, and she had to put her hood up. Principal White, you were looking for me? Yes. Principal White nodded, his eyes still on her. I heard you had an apprenticeship banquet last night. I did. Bessie was a little stunned. She hadn't told Principal White about that. Bessie didn't say much about Bertha informing Michael and Samuel about her apprenticeship. But Principal White was different. His appearance would have changed the whole dynamic of the event. Principal White went silent for a while. Your teacher must be Mr. Grint. You rejected me the last time because you said you didn't want to go to the Capitol. You've changed your mind now? Bessie was looking down at her shoes and did not reply. Principal White did not wait for her answer. He asked another question. Do you have something against me? 
Ah, uh, Bessie looked up and smiled. No, why would you think that? Give me a bit more time to think about it. She didn't tell Principal White that Bertha was the one in charge of this thing with Mr. Grint. Her willingness to think about it further meant that there was still room for negotiation. Principal White looked at her deeply. Then please, think about it carefully. Bessie went quiet for a while before saying, I'll consider it. Principal White had wanted Bessie to be his successor in the first place, but she had rejected him for many years. This was the first time she had left room for discussion and consideration. All right then, take your time. Whenever he thought about how she had agreed to Mr. Grint's request, his heart ached. Principal White said goodbye to Bessie and left. There was some progress today, but compared to Mr. Grint's achievement of making Bessie his apprentice, this was nothing to be proud of. Principal White made a phone call while walking to his car. Inside the school doctor's office, Bessie returned and saw that Michael was moving her other gifts to the couch. Bessie, what did Principal White say? Samuel took a few pairs of silverware from the pantry. Bessie squatted by the couch with her gifts, but did not look up. He's concerned about my studies. Oh. Samuel nodded, trying to accept that answer. Bessie opened the bag that Toby had given her and paused for a moment, then shut it again. What did Sun God give you? I want to see it. Samuel reached for it, but Bessie's glare made him pull his hand back. Scarlet's belongings, which had been with Bessie's gifts, were in a small backpack. Bessie opened it up and saw that it contained a stack of discs. They were the video recordings of Bessie's birthdays from the age of 9 to 14. Scarlet was just like her mother. She had enjoyed filming since she was a child. Each time she traveled, she would take tons of photographs and videos of architecture and other things she saw. It was Scarlet's mother who started filming her birthday videos but Scarlet took over when she was 13. Bessie wasn't a fan of these recordings, and so she had left them in Scarlet's house. The disc for her 13th birthday was broken. Bessie opened the box for her 13th birthday and saw a stack of photographs. They were photographs of Scarlet from the ages of 7 to 14. Samuel was about to pick the photos up to have a look, but Michael glanced at him. Samuel got the message and didn't dare touch them. Bessie, you're close to Scarlet. There was a photo of both of them right at the top. The girl with the short hair and cold expression was Bessie. The other girl was smiling radiantly. Samuel was stunned. That didn't look like Scarlet. Michael slowly looked away, not wanting to look at it any longer. He took the glass bottle hanging on the violin and looked at it for a while before putting it back. Bessie put Scarlet's belongings back down and then grabbed Daniel's plastic bag. This is the gift your friend gave you, right? The giant supermarket bag was too obvious. Marvin recognized it right away. He laid the table and then looked towards Bessie. That was the most normal-looking gift he saw that night. Bessie turned the plastic bag upside down and a pink crystal bigger than a coin rolled out. It was pure and uncut. It rolled across the table and reflected the light pouring in from the window. Marvin was speechless. He was stunned as he squatted down and picked up the crystal. Bessie, this is... Marvin had seen a pink crystal before, but not this close up. It was beautiful. Samuel looked towards it. What? He didn't see it. Bessie took it back expressionlessly and tossed it back into the plastic bag. Nothing much, just a piece of glass. Oh, Marvin nodded, still in confusion. He didn't know what to think. Samuel hadn't seen it clearly and simply nodded as well. He then moved towards Bessie. Bessie, when are we going to Devil City to watch the Sun God play? We might not go, Bessie replied coldly as she tidied up all the gifts. She remembered the report that Daniel sent to her. She then took out her cell phone and looked for the photograph, showing it to Michael. Do you know what this is? Michael was leaning against the couch. He wasn't wearing a jacket and his shirt was a little wrinkled. He took the cell phone and had a look. When he saw the contents of the report, his laid-back attitude vanished. He narrowed his eyes and straightened up, pointing at the phone screen. Who sent you this report? A friend. Bessie pursed her lips. It's my grandma's report. 
Radiation. Michael stood up and began murmuring to himself. He then opened the glass door and walked into his office. On the other side of town, Mr. Grint had just ended a call with the National Violin Association. They were all asking about Bessie. Mr. Grint hadn't announced or publicized Bessie's apprenticeship in the capital yet. He wasn't planning to do so until the following year. How do you think Bessie knows the Clark and Bright families? Mr. Sampson asked. He had finally recovered from his shock, but it was all still unbelievable to him. Mr. Grint shook his head and smiled. I was thinking of paving the way for her. Who would have known that she's practically the one doing that for me? The previous night, Rick had specially thanked him for finding Officer Gomez. Mr. Sampson poured a cup of water and handed it to Mr. Grint, who was sitting on the couch. The Clark, Bright, and Soup families are all accounted for. We're just short of the White and Flake families. The Flake family are easygoing people, but the White family are known to be a little isolated and arrogant, not too approachable. Mr. Sampson shook his head and smiled. Then there was a knock at the door. Episode 138 Who Do You Think You Are? Who would knock on the door at this hour? Mr. Sampson asked, startled. Only a few people knew that Mr. Grint was in Chicago, and they had already come to visit him in the past two days. Today, only those from the other violin associations had called. Who else could it be? Mr. Sampson put down the teapot in his hand and walked over to the door. An old man stood outside, wearing reading glasses and a black tunic suit, looking neat and meticulous. Mr. Sampson froze for a moment in surprise before reacting. Principal... Principal White? The White family generally stayed in their circle and didn't appear in public, but Kenneth was acquainted with Mr. Grint. So, Mr. Sampson had indeed seen Principal White personally before. It was just that Principal White rarely interacted with other families. Although Mr. Grint was still in contact with Kenneth, he was distant from the White family. After all, it wasn't as though the families in Evanston could be close to him just because they tried. Excuse me, this is Mr. Grint's room, right? Principal White glanced at the door number. Yes. Mr. Sampson answered and hurriedly opened the door. Please come in. Mr. Sampson closed the door once Principal White was inside the room. Mr. Grint, it's Principal White, Mr. Sampson announced. Mr. Grint, who had just put down his phone and was holding a glass of water, stood up and put the glass down in surprise. Principal White, please sit, he said. Mr. Grint also felt strange. He wasn't that close to the White family. Why was Principal White looking for him? Mr. Sampson poured a cup of tea for Principal White. Mr. Grint, I came on behalf of one of my students, Bessie, Principal White said, straight away while holding the teacup in his hand. I heard you accepted her as a student yesterday. Oh, so you're here to offer your best wishes, Mr. Grint said, surprised but managing to conceal it. It was because of Bessie again? Mr. Sampson was too shocked to move. A character like Principal White was also Bessie's friend? But then again, people like Samuel had turned out to be her friends, so perhaps it was a small matter to include someone like Principal White, Mr. Sampson thought to himself. It's not just that. Principal White shook his head. He took a sip of tea, fell silent for a while, and then said faintly, I just wanted to ask you, how did you make Bessie agree to learn the violin from you? Mr. Grint was taken aback. He hadn't expected Principal White to ask this question. You also know that I've yet to settle on an heir. Principal White continued. These past three years, I've been in Chicago searching for an heir. I chose someone, but they have refused to accept my offer many times. Principal White had decided to lay all his cards on the table because he wanted to know how Mr. Grint had made Bessie become his student. Mr. Grint nodded while listening. You might have guessed that I'm talking about your disciple, Bessie. Principal White put the cup on the table and looked up. Oh, Mr. Grint nodded. He self-consciously took another sip of water as he processed this. When he realized what Principal White was saying, he finally reacted. 
He coughed violently, and Mr. Sampson hurriedly patted his back. Principal White watched Mr. Grint's face turn red and wasn't at all sympathetic. After coughing for several minutes, Mr. Grint finally was able to stop. He looked up and placed his glass of water forcefully on the table. Principal White, what did you just say? I seemed to have heard wrong. Principal White repeated himself with a blank expression. I know her temper well, Principal White said, looking at Mr. Grint faintly. I just want to know, how did you persuade her? Oh, Mr. Grint was still in a daze and not quite in his right mind. You definitely can't persuade her. You have to ask her grandma to do it. Her grandma? Principal White asked. Mr. Grint nodded. Principal White stood up gracefully. Mr. Grint, my apologies for taking the liberty to disturb you today. I have booked a table at the Grand Kennedy tomorrow. I hope you will do me the honor of joining me. After that, Principal White left. Mr. Grint and Mr. Sampson still hadn't fully reacted to this new information. Did Principal White just say that his chosen heir is Bessie? Mr. Grint asked, glancing at Mr. Sampson. The influence of the White family in Evanston was extraordinary and in a completely different circle from Mr. Grint. People respected and revered Mr. Grint, but the White family had real power in their hands. Mr. Sampson nodded with difficulty. Yes, it seems so. Grace, Daryl, David, and all the important members of the Smith family seemed to be at the hospital. Grace entered Bertha's room and said, Mom, Mr. Smith is here to see you. She helped Bertha cushion the pillow behind her. Bertha was low in energy and just glanced at them before coughing twice and saying lightly, Thank you. Everyone in the Smith family except David and Daryl frowned at her attitude. In their eyes, Grace's family was riding Anne's coattails. Bertha was just a rural woman who could only live in the VIP ward of the hospital due to the Smith family's privilege. They wondered that she still thought so highly of herself. But they didn't say it out loud. Grace tried speaking more slowly. You didn't attend the apprenticeship banquet in Evanston, so we discussed it and have decided to hold another one in Chicago. Grace said to Bertha, our two families can attend and interact with one another for these two days. Hearing this, Bertha finally opened her eyes. She stared at Grace, then closed her eyes again. I'm not going, she said in a sickly, cold voice. Grace pursed her lips. Daryl maintained the smile on his face and said, She's probably tired. You don't have to force her. His tone was slow and his emotions were inscrutable. Everyone but Grace then left the ward. One of the younger family members frowned and said, Grandpa, Bertha is too ignorant. Daryl put his hand behind his back and said lightly, She's a countrywoman. There's no need to haggle with her. The elevator door opened. An old man wearing reading glasses came out. David had met Principal White when Anne started school so he recognized him at once. He froze for a moment before quickly greeting him. Principal White? Principal White was eager to find Bertha, so he only paused briefly when he heard someone calling him. He pulled down his glasses and didn't recognize David, so he just nodded and didn't reply. After he had gone past them, the Smith family walked into the elevator. Once the elevator door closed, Daryl glanced at David. That person just now... He's Principal White, David said in a low voice. Three years ago, he became Brightbow High School's principal. I heard he's from Evanston, and every month, an unknown person with a special license plate number comes to find him. Daryl was shocked and pondered this for a while before saying, He came here because of the former principal's inefficiency. The students and teachers of Brightbow High School all knew this, so it wasn't considered a secret, but nobody knew who Principal White was. After all, in Evanston, searching for someone or even mentioning a name could get you blacklisted. I've already arranged the banquet tomorrow. As for Bessie... David stopped thinking about Principal White and paused at the mention of Bessie. Daryl glanced at him and was silent for a moment before saying, There's no need to notify her. At first, Daryl wanted David to win over Bessie. 
However, because of the incident with Chloe, they had no choice but to side with Anne. At the moment, he felt thankful for that incident. Otherwise, the issue of choosing between the sisters would have still been unsolved, and they might have failed to please both. David sighed but didn't say anything else. In the school's medical office, Michael's table had a few more beakers and flasks on it than usual. He was also holding a test tube in his hand. Bessie had laid across the table and was practicing her writing. She had skipped her afternoon class. Mr. Scott had been very forgiving to her lately. Of course, all the other teachers except the physics teacher had been very indulgent to her. Although she was a little impatient, she still pursed her lips and wrote word by word. Robert was lying on a chair like a corpse. Samuel leaned on the sofa and raised an eyebrow at Marvin. What's wrong with Robert? He asked. It seems the photo of Daniel he had on his phone got deleted by someone. Marvin replied, giving Robert a sympathetic glance. Robert had only one picture of Daniel, and it had been deleted. In this modern, digital era, very few people printed photos. If he had known Daniel had such a capable hacker supporting him, he wouldn't have courted disaster like this. He would have printed thousands of copies of Daniel's photo. My uncle is busy again today, Robert said, covering his head with the pillow. He put his legs on the table, completely succumbing to his misfortune. He told me to contact Officer Gomez, so I went to his workplace a few times, but I still couldn't find him. At the mention of this, Marvin and Samuel looked at Robert with even odder expressions. Neither of them dared to tell Robert that not only had they seen his uncle Rick last night, but Officer Gomez as well. Robert looked at the time on his phone and stood up. I'm going to look for Officer Gomez again. He said. He glanced at Bessie, who was still lying on the table. She has no class? It was almost three o'clock, according to the high school schedule. Shouldn't she just be getting out of her first lesson? Marvin said lightly, Her teacher doesn't care. Robert froze. Then he thought about how she had scored a total of 646, excluding physics. Coughed and left with his coat. Bessie finished another page. The phone in her pocket vibrated. She took it out absent-mindedly. It was a message from James. She raised her hand and threw her pen onto the table. Bessie leaned back in the chair and called him immediately, her voice low. Dad? James sounded very happy and spoke in a rather loud voice. Bessie, I just got to Chicago. Come out with me tomorrow after school. I'll treat you to a good meal. Bessie flipped through her copybook and raised an eyebrow. Why did you come here so suddenly? The Smith family invited us, so I came with your grandma and the others. James paused and then said a little cautiously, And your brother, too. If you don't want to see him, I won't bring him along. Bessie closed the book, rubbed her temples, and thought for a while. Where are you now? We just got off the bus at the bus station. James answered in a loud voice. The Smith family's car is driving us to the hotel. He had sent her a message the moment he got off the bus. Bessie glanced at Michael, who was looking at something under a microscope. She stood up, took two steps to the side, and whispered, Which hotel? James told her the hotel's name. Coincidentally, it was the same hotel where Mr. Grint and Daniel were staying. Bessie still had several things to ask Daniel, so she said, Okay, wait there. I'll come find you. Half an hour later, she was at the Madison International Hotel, a five-star hotel in Chicago. It was owned by the World Poker Tour. It was a first-class place in terms of confidentiality. By the time Bessie arrived, James and all of the Wilson family relatives were all in the lobby. James was wearing a new trench coat and his face was a little tanned. He was anxiously saying something to a short-haired woman, nodding and bowing with a flushed face. A ten-year-old boy stood beside him. The short-haired woman stood beside two men in black, who seemed to be either assistants or bodyguards. The other relatives from the Wilson family stood very far away as if they didn't know James. Bessie approached, frowning. What's going on? She asked. The short-haired woman glanced at Bessie and paused at how she was dressed. She raised a sharp eyebrow and didn't reply to Bessie. She just looked at James lightly and said, We'll wait for the police to come first. Bessie looked to the side and saw a young woman behind the bodyguards and the short-haired woman. It was rather cold, so she wore a coat over her dress. She had wavy curls and looked very charming. 
She was wearing black sunglasses and her face couldn't be seen clearly, but someone was taking pictures of her not far away, so she was probably a celebrity. Aunt Ruth was responsible for the Wilson family's accommodation, so she called David over and ignored Bessie. If this incident became a big problem, it would affect the Smith family the most. Her expression was dark and she looked extremely irritated. Tucker bumped Miss Simpson just now and afterward her necklace was missing, so your aunt said Tucker took it. James said, although Tucker is disobedient, he didn't do it. James pursed his lips. Bessie, don't stand here with us. The police are arriving soon. James didn't want to implicate Bessie. The rest of the Wilson family had already distanced themselves and Aunt Ruth didn't even want to talk to them. Bessie was pretty clear on the situation after hearing this. She glanced at Tucker and said quietly, Wouldn't you know after looking at the surveillance video? Aunt Ruth glanced at Bessie and smirked a little when she heard Bessie say something only an ignorant country bumpkin would say. The short-haired woman glanced sharply at Bessie and suddenly laughed. Do you think you own the Madison International Hotel? Can you see the surveillance video when you like? Bessie raised an eyebrow after hearing this. Episode 139, The Necklace is Returned World Poker Tour was low-key. Many companies were under the World Poker Tour umbrella, but none of them could be associated with the company. The Madison International Hotel was one of them. Everyone understood the World Poker Tour's regulations. No matter who you were, if you did business with the World Poker Tour, everyone was safe and all information was kept confidential. This was one of the reasons why the World Poker Tour quietly joined the five giant industries. So it was impossible to request the surveillance footage from the Madison International Hotel. They could only wait to file a police report. These things were considered unspoken rules. This is why the short-haired woman had spoken mockingly after hearing Bessie mention the surveillance video. Aunt Ruth had already called David and concisely explained the situation to him. The woman wearing the sunglasses was someone of high status, so it was useless to call Grace. After hanging up the phone, Aunt Ruth looked impatiently at James and the others. Don't think that this place is the same as the other places. Do you think you can see the surveillance video if and when you like? The police are coming soon. We'll just wait until then, Aunt Ruth said. Then she went to negotiate with the short-haired woman. James bowed his head. He didn't know why the surveillance here could not be seen, but the way Aunt Ruth and the short-haired woman stared at him made him feel very uncomfortable. Bessie, don't worry about it. Tucker did not take it. James whispered, he's not that kind of kid. Bessie simply replied, okay, and then sent a message on her phone. I'm going upstairs to find a friend first, she said. Bessie tucked her phone into her pocket, ready to go upstairs and find Daniel. James desperately wanted her to leave, so he nodded quickly. Bessie turned and went towards the stairs. Tucker was avoiding looking at her, but came immediately when Bessie gestured with her head for him to follow her. Wait for me down here, Bessie told them. She then pointed at Tucker. There are too many people here. I'll bring him up first. The short-haired woman was focused on James and did not stop Bessie from taking Tucker away. The hotel only had one entrance so he would not be able to slip away. Daniel had hung a do not disturb sign on his room door, but Bessie simply ignored it. She knocked three times, anxious and dry mouthed. Daniel got up from working on a pile of papers and opened the door. He didn't expect to see Bessie with a short person beside her, so he raised an eyebrow and asked, who is this? My father's son, Bessie answered. She went straight in and squatted among the pile of papers. She reached out and turned over two papers. They were filled with a bunch of medical terms. Daniel nodded and didn't ask any more questions. Bessie knew her limits, so if she had brought someone here, it must have been someone trustworthy. Bessie asked Tucker to sit on the sofa and then picked up Daniel's computer. Did you discover anything? She asked. Daniel was staying in a suite with an exquisitely decorated living room. There was a floor-to-ceiling window on one side, and the overall style of the room was very European. Daniel rummaged inside a drawer and handed Tucker a rock about the size of a thumb. Hey kid, play with this. 
Tucker took it and played with it in the light shining through the window. His eyes were focused on the rock, and he didn't make a single sound. A little, Daniel replied to Bessie. He opened a bottle of water and leaned against the computer desk. There are a few things I don't know, though. You probably know that your grandma has radiation poisoning, right? The question is what caused it, but I can't find out. Daniel pointed to a row of numbers on the computer. I thought about it, and I want to apologize to you. This matter had nothing to do with your neighbor who repairs computers. He had misread her neighbor. Bessie leaned on the back of a chair and could not be bothered to reply. She flipped through her phone and opened the report that Michael had sent to her. Look at this. She handed the report to Daniel. Daniel closed the file on his computer with one hand and took the phone from Bessie with the other. At first, he just looked at it casually, but after reading the document, he suddenly sobered. Uranium? Americium? Daniel held the phone tightly in his hand. Who gave this to you? Michael, she replied. Daniel nodded, then took two steps forward and flipped through the mess to get to his machine. It should be fine if it was him. I think I'm close to figuring it out. He took out Bertha's report from last time and analyzed it again. Finally, he looked up at Bessie. There is no laboratory here, so it's too inconvenient for me. I need to go back to Evanston. Daniel had an impulsive temperament. Bessie stood up. When? Now. I have a flight at 7 o'clock. Daniel glanced at his watch and frowned. That dog is still looking for me, and he even has a picture of me on his phone. He doesn't have a picture of you anymore, Bessie said lightly. Don't worry, just leave. The phone in her pocket rang. It was James. He asked for Tucker to come down. Bessie thought the police had arrived, so she sent Tucker to James. Wait for me. I still have something to do. I'll come down after I'm done. She then helped Daniel hide his information. She received a call from Officer Gomez just as she entered Daniel's bedroom. Bessie closed the door before answering the phone. You called just in time, she told Officer Gomez, watching Daniel pack his bags. Come over and help me deal with someone. The people after Daniel wanted to catch someone under her protection? Impossible. Downstairs in the lobby, they were still waiting for the police. David and Grace arrived first. Take everyone else to their rooms for now, or they can stay in the lounge if they want. David instructed Grace as he rubbed his temple. They can't all stand around here. He didn't even look at James's relatives. Instead, he negotiated with the short-haired woman. Everyone knew that the Smith family were the ones entertaining guests today, so they would lose face if the police were to get involved. The short-haired woman saw David and finally introduced herself. I'm Rihanna Simpson, Miss Victoria Simpson's manager. Miss Simpson's necklace is the dream heart given to her by a sponsor. Its monetary value is simply too great. We have no choice but to detain them. The dream heart was a new diamond necklace. It was endorsed by Victoria. David's expression became more serious. I will take care of this. I hope it will be as soon as possible. The short-haired woman said lightly, Victoria was going to wear this necklace in Noah Hyber's new music video tomorrow. If you cannot find it, I will have to report it to the police. David's expression darkened even more. Noah Hyber was very well known in recent years. People from the age of 80 down to the kindergartners all knew who he was. When he debuted, he did not do interviews and did not hype himself up. Instead, he focused only on his music, but inexplicably was still able to make himself famous. Victoria and her manager waited in the lobby. David turned back to Grace's relatives. The Madison International was a low-key luxury hotel, so the relatives were all nervous at being in such a place for the first time. Grace walked over to James with a dark expression. What the hell are you doing? She asked. If it were not for Anne personally inviting him, Grace would not have tolerated seeing her ex-husband. James's face flushed red. I already said it wasn't Tucker. One of Grace's relatives, who had always been mean, said disdainfully, who else could it be? This Tucker is just like your eldest daughter, skipping classes every day. He's a little bandit who gets into fights with his schoolmates even at such a young age. I heard that he's been suspended by the school. Grace's face was tight. 
Tucker looked over at the relative. How dare you say this in front of her? She froze and suddenly flushed with agitation. Say this in front of Bessie? Why? Because she was a lunatic? James, look at your son's attitude. The relative immediately turned to James and complained. How could you still insist that he didn't do it? Grace's relatives were noisy and had no limits to their rudeness. David had never dealt with this kind of person before, so he rubbed his aching head and then went to the lounge to wait for Anne and Daryl. It wasn't convenient for him to take responsibility for James's son. Today's banquet had been specially arranged according to Anne's wishes. Anne's situation in Evanston had already stabilized. She was going back to Brightbow High School today to settle the formalities. So the Smith family had arranged for the Wilson family's relatives to come to Chicago today. Daryl now placed great importance on Anne and had gone to pick her up personally. David didn't have to wait long before Anne arrived, but Daryl waited outside in the car. The two of them had heard about this incident on the road. Regardless of the truth behind it, this matter still had a great impact on Anne's banquet. Anne, I told you not to invite these messy and inappropriate people. They bring along a foul atmosphere. Just look at the trouble now. Aunt Ruth said. She was standing outside, too unconcerned to deal with the other relatives. This was starting to seem like a joke. Anne pursed her lips and felt like her pride had been torn apart. How could such a mess have happened before the banquet even started? It was as if everything was working against her. Mr. Anderson's students had also accompanied her, so she was afraid that they might laugh at her because of this. Anne's chest heaved and her anger raged inside. These relatives were so troublesome. Anne turned directly to Grace. Mom, what did Tucker say? Grace shook her head. He said he didn't take it. Aunt Ruth glanced at Anne and immediately said, I saw Bessie just now too. Really? Shouldn't she be in class now? Anne narrowed her eyes. David was also stunned. He didn't remember telling Bessie about this. Moreover, with Bessie's character, she wouldn't have come even if he had told her. Aunt Ruth shook her head, paused for a moment, and then continued in a mocking voice. It's not surprising to see her here when she should be in school. In the Smith family, Aunt Ruth had often heard about Bessie's truancy and bad grades. Anne nodded and dropped the subject. She couldn't worry about Bessie right now. Grace's expression froze. She felt very complicated when she heard that Bessie had skipped school to come here. At that moment, the door of the lounge opened. Look, is this the diamond that the celebrity lost? One of the relatives held up a diamond about the size of a thumb and showed it to Grace and Anne. I took it from that little bandit, Tucker, and he almost bit my hand. She didn't know much about diamonds, but the stone was beautiful. Anne and Grace had spent many years in a prestigious family and could recognize diamonds. So they recognized the diamond at first glance. Anne's expression turned solemn and she went in to find Tucker. Grace and David followed her. Why did you steal from someone today? Did you think my life was going too smoothly? Anne asked. She held the diamond and wished that she could smash it into Tucker's eyes. His eyes looked just like Bessie's. Tucker was silent. His eyes were red and he just grabbed at the thing in Anne's hand like a beast. James did not expect Tucker to be found with the diamond in his hand. He froze for a moment and then looked down at him. Tucker Miller, where did you get that? Anne was too tired to explain and just handed the diamond to Aunt Ruth. Take this to Victoria. I'll go over later to apologize directly. My new friend gave this to me. Tucker broke away from James with sudden strength and snatched the diamond away from Aunt Ruth with red eyes. The relative sneered loudly. What new friend? My sister's new friend. Tucker put the diamond in his pocket and squeezed it tightly. He stared at the people around him, alert like a cheetah. Anne froze for a moment and then pursed her lips. You mean Bessie? Tucker stared at her coldly and did not reply. Anne nodded. Then she turned to Grace and said, Mom, you heard that. She skipped class to instigate Tucker to do this kind of thing to destroy my banquet. She simply detests me. Grace's mouth fell open. Anne turned towards Aunt Ruth and said, Call the police. Grace's expression changed. Anne! 
David also spoke. Let it go since the diamond has been found. Let's settle this privately. Bessie wouldn't do this. Anne didn't expect these people to stand on Bessie's side, so she sneered. She wouldn't? Then what's with Victoria's diamond? Could it possibly be Bessie's or her rogue friend's? Episode 140, The Surveillance Video is Found None of them had expected this incident to blow up like this. Grace wanted to say something, but after glancing at Anne, she couldn't figure out what Anne was thinking and decided to keep quiet. David paused. This was not Bessie's style. With her personality, she wouldn't do such a shameless thing even if she did want revenge. Instead, she would have attacked directly as she had with Stephen. What's the situation? Daryl asked. He had been waiting downstairs with two students who had come with Anne. He waited for a while and was afraid that something had gone wrong, so he had come up. David succinctly explained to Daryl about the diamond in Tucker's hands. Daryl frowned. David ignored Daryl's expression and started to say something. Anne. But Daryl interrupted him directly. Don't get involved with this matter, he said. Daryl had long seen through the war of the two sisters in the Miller family, and it did not matter if Anne continued to stir up trouble. It probably has nothing to do with Bessie, but there's no escaping the situation now. So we can clear her name when the police come. You shouldn't say anything. What will Anne think if you take Bessie's side? So you don't think it was her? David pursed his lips. Daryl said lightly, That's not important. Daryl didn't want to talk to David about the situation anymore. I will go to Miss Simpson, Daryl said. The Wilson family's relatives were all over the place. Daryl didn't want to stay long. Anne nodded and turned to Aunt Ruth. Aunt Ruth, follow him and ask Miss Simpson over. Then she glanced at James. Since David was present, she didn't greet him as father and instead said with a stony expression, You should call her down. She meant Bessie. James frowned and took a deep breath. Bessie only came after the diamond had been lost, so what does this have to do with her? Ask her. For all I know, she instructed Tucker to do this ahead of time, Anne said, closing her eyes and trying to ignore James. She didn't know when James had started protecting Bessie so much. Grace took out her phone, thought about it for a moment, and approached James instead. Tell her to come down. She will not answer my call. Not only did she refuse to answer the call, but ever since the last time they'd spoken, Bessie's phone was always busy when she called. She didn't seem to have been blacklisted, but she still couldn't get through to Bessie. She will still have to come down when the police come, Grace whispered. At the same time upstairs, Daniel was finishing moving his stuff. There's a car with the license plate 1111. It's Officer Gomez's special car and it's parked at the back door. Bessie closed the door and led Daniel through the staff entrance. Daniel put on a black scarf and said in a muffled voice, Isn't the staff entrance locked? The last time, when Robert had put his picture up in the square, he had wanted to take the staff entrance, but it had been locked. It was not that Daniel didn't have the means to unlock it but there were too many surveillance cameras in the lobby and the Madison International Hotel security guards would arrive before he could open it. As he spoke, Bessie pushed the door lightly and it opened. Daniel pulled his scarf tighter and raised an eyebrow in surprise. It's unlocked today? The staff access to the Madison International Hotel was different from the public access. The back door was very small and only a few people could go through it at a time. Bessie watched him get on the elevator and did not go down with him. Instead, she closed the staff entrance and went back into the hotel with his room card. She didn't expect to bump into Mr. Sampson in the elevator. Bessie paused. Mr. Sampson, where are you going? She asked. Mr. Sampson looked at Bessie with an inscrutable expression and said very respectfully in a low voice, I'm going down to start the car. Mr. Grint has a banquet today. Not many people could persuade Mr. Grint to come to dinner, given his status. Bessie nodded and didn't ask further. She got off the elevator on Daniel's floor. As she stepped out of the elevator, she received a phone call from an unknown number. It was her aunt. A police car was parked outside of the Madison International Hotel. 
Three minutes later, Bessie appeared in the lounge on the first floor. Her aunt was still taunting Tucker. When she saw Bessie, she suddenly quietened. James hadn't called her and was surprised to see Bessie. Bessie, why are you here? Bessie shook her head and watched as Tucker clutched something in his pocket. His head was bowed and his eyes were red. Two people were taking notes next to them. Bessie lowered her eyebrows and asked Tucker, What's the situation? Your brother stole someone else's diamond, her aunt said quietly. Other relatives also whispered, They have brought shame to our family. Bessie reached out her hand. With a loud bang, she closed the door of the lounge. The sound was deafening. She turned to look at the relatives and licked her lips. I asked Tucker, she said. Her relatives hadn't expected Bessie to behave like this in front of the policeman, so they were instantly scared and fell silent. Bessie turned to Tucker. Tell me. Tucker looked up and said in a rather calm voice, They said that I stole this, but my new friend gave it to me. Anne couldn't take it anymore. Bessie, does the thing in Tucker's hand have anything to do with you? Bessie smiled. It belongs to my friend. You can think of it as a gift from me. Anne nodded and turned to David. She said angrily, Dad, did you hear that? The diamond did not look like something Bessie or her friend would have. The group of relatives heard what Bessie said and immediately muttered among themselves, It has nothing to do with us. They couldn't wait to be a hundred feet away from Bessie. They had heard from Anne that this diamond necklace was worth nearly one million dollars. The punishment for stealing was three years in prison. Daryl and Aunt Ruth had already spoken to Victoria's manager and were walking over with her. You can just give us the diamond back, Rihanna said. She knew about the Smith family and was rather polite to Daryl. Victoria will not be coming forward. She's a public figure and it's not convenient for her to make a scene. The sponsor would be unhappy if they heard about this. She paused and looked at Daryl before saying lightly, I just did not expect the Smith family to have such relatives. Daryl looked embarrassed and awkward. The two of them reached the lounge. Rihanna pushed open the door and went in. She ignored Bessie and James and went straight to Anne and David. Where's Victoria's necklace? Are you still holding on to it? Anne asked Tucker. Aren't you afraid of embarrassing yourself? James opened his mouth as if to speak. Bessie folded her arms and said very calmly to David, This is your attitude? Daryl was afraid David would say something. So he quickly said, Bessie, let's just talk about the facts. The apparent facts were that Tucker had taken it. Daryl had no other choice. Anne would be alienated from the Smith family if he so much as showed suspicion towards her. Compared to Bessie, it was simply too easy to choose Anne. David pursed his lips and his heart sank. He had tried to improve his relationship with Bessie privately before, but they were still rather distant. Now that this had happened... Improving their relationship was no longer a possibility. The two families would not rest until they broke off all connections. However, Bessie laughed and lifted her chin at Tucker. She said casually, Give it to her. Tucker thought about it and took out the stone slowly. Her aunt grabbed it directly and handed it to Rihanna. Look! Anne couldn't bear to watch and simply turned to the policeman beside her. Please do what you have to do. Rihanna took the necklace and was surprised. This is not Victoria's necklace. Victoria's dream heart was a new product of the Lux Jewelry Company and was finely polished. The diamond was set on a delicate platinum necklace, but it was obvious that this stone had not been polished before. Anne was shocked. Then where is Victoria's necklace? Bessie was not surprised. At that moment, the manager of the hotel rushed in. Rihanna and Daryl both knew him and immediately greeted him politely. Mr. Peterson. The Madison International Hotel belonged to World Poker Tour and was part of an elite circle, so nobody knew what kind of connections the manager had to the senior executives. Even in trivial matters, these two did not dare to treat him poorly. Mr. Peterson nodded perfunctorily without speaking. He walked forward quickly, panting and gasping for breath perhaps because of his weight. He turned to Bessie and complained in a low voice, Bessie, why did you come back downstairs? No wonder I couldn't find you when I went to the room upstairs. After a pause, he said, This is the surveillance video you wanted. 
he reached out and passed her a tablet. Episode 141 The Banks VIP Anne and the two police officers 